Amen. All right, beginning there in verse 1, chapter number 12, verse 1, the Bible reads, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So he starts off by saying, I beseech you. And the word beseech means to beg or to strongly urge. And he says, I beseech you, therefore. Now, the word therefore tells you that we were talking about something else. So because of what I just said, therefore. So notice the, the whole, now let, let's look at the whole sentence. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now back up to verse number 31 of chapter 11. Actually, we'll read verse 30 in chapter 11 as well. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. God, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. So he's saying that he wishes that he could have, or he wants to have mercy upon all. God desires that all would be saved. He wants to have mercy upon all. And then he goes directly into this after saying that he wants to have mercy upon all. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Obviously, speaking after the fact of how great his mercy is. So when we get into uh, Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1, and he starts off, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, because God has such great mercy, I urge you or I beg you is what he's referring to. You always, therefore, is a very important word. You, you always have to see what the therefore is there for. Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called. Let's use a scripture that's just not debatable, right? That we can just see what it says, therefore. Something plain and simple. You always have to see what the word therefore is being used for. So continue reading there. We're going to verse number one one more time. I want to focus on the latter part. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So he's begging you by the mercies of God. Something that's great. This is something that should even more so urge you to do something. That you present your bodies. Can somebody turn this light on? I was thinking, why in the world is it so dark? That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Service. So he likens it unto. If I can go back off. He likens it, likens you unto being a living sacrifice. Obviously, all throughout the Old Testament, there are tons of writings, laws, commandments, talks of the practices and ordinances of offering sacrifices, burnt sacrifices, all different types of sacrifices. The Bible talks about the Old Testament. Now he says here to be a living sacrifice, which almost seems like a contradiction in terms. But of course, we all understand what he's saying, right? To sacrifice something is to give up something that is needful or important. What more do you have than your life? Think about that. Your, your life is really, in, in, you know, in the abundance of things, it's really the only thing that you have. It's all, everything that you possess is going to be connected to your life. That's really all you have. And he said... Be a living sacrifice. Live your life, and what should you do in your life? You should just sacrifice your entire life. Why? Because of all that God has done for you. For your salvation? Of course not. But it's what you should do. I'm not talking about what you must do. I'm talking about what you should do. Because of all the mercy that was shown unto you, because of everything that God did for you on the cross, everything that he did for you, the whole, all of the gospel just giving you life in general, you should be a living sacrifice. Look at the next statement after that too. Holy, acceptable unto God. Obviously allusion, an allusion to speaking about you being a sacrifice. And then he says this, which is your reasonable service. Now think about that concept. If you were to sacrifice your entire life, just dedicate your entire life to God. People use that statement about salvation, again, for clarification purposes. I'm speaking about after salvation, just dedicating your entire life to serving God. That's all that you do. You're not doing that much. That's your reasonable service. You're not going above and beyond. That's reasonable. Like, yeah, that's reasonable. That's not all that great. That's, re that's reasonable for everything that he did for you. Why would you be doing it? Because of the great mercies. That he showed unto you. Let's see this again. Could turn over to, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Yep, 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 19. Watch what he says right here. <clears throat> Paul again. What? Know ye not that your, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Which ye have of God? And then he says this. And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. 
And then it says this, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which, which are God's. In the book of Acts, I can't remember the exact chapter, I think it's uh, maybe, maybe, maybe 18, it's right around there, where the Bible talks about that the Holy Ghost purchased the, the church with his own blood. And right here we say, for ye are bought with a price, right? Because Christ died for us, right? And then he says, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Here, this is the concept. For you to be a living sacrifice, you're not going above and beyond because your body is already, it's, it's the purchased possession. He's already purchased you and bought you. The least, he already owns your body. He owns your life. The least you, you could do is just sacrifice. I mean, think of, the, think of the, the, the penalty and the punishment of what you really deserve. A lot of times the extremity and the severity of hell goes over our heads after we're saved for a long time, like I, I talked about on Sunday. Sometimes, you know, we can become numb to the gospel. And it's not as great as it was the first time we heard it, or it's not as precious to us the first time we heard it. But maybe if you kind of sat down for a few minutes and thought about the severity of the punishment of hell, maybe, you know, these, this statement when he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, maybe that would mean a little bit more to you. Maybe that would kind of say, hey, I know what he's saying. By the mercies of God, what you deserve is to go to hell. You deserve to go to hell. You know when you're giving the gospel to somebody over and over again when you go out soul winning and you're explaining to them, I always go to Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 10, and I read there at the bottom that it says that they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I always ask the person, you know, I'll ask them their name. What was your name again? Josh. Okay, Josh. Uh, let me ask you a question real quick, Josh. When you die, how long are you going to be dead? And they'll say, forever. I just read that verse. And I ask them after that, I say, okay, so you're going to be dead forever. So if you were to die and you were to go to hell, how long would you be there? And normally, right then when I'm giving the gospel, people are like, forever. Because it like sets in. Like if you, when you die today, you're going to be dead for all eternity. For all eternity. So if you go to hell, you're going to be there forever. Ever and ever. And guess what? In 20,000 years, you're not even close to the end because there is no end. In a million years, you're not even close to the end. In a billion years, a trillion years, you're not even close to the end because there is no end. That's what you deserve. That's what God redeemed you from. That's what he did for you. The least that you could do is give your entire life serving him. To sacrifice your life and to do everything for him. Everything should be to the glory of God. Obviously, we're, we're, we're men. And we're, and we're sinful in nature, but we should at least attempt to do that with all of our ability. Go back to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. So he says, it's your reasonable service. Verse number 2, he says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. So but is, you know, it's a conjunction. And he actually uses the same word right there with just a different prefix. He says, don't be conformed. And what, is, what does co mean in speech? Does anyone remember? It means like with. It's, it's speaking of two things, right? Conform, he's saying, don't be formed like with this world. Conform would be you being exactly like everything around you, exactly like everyone around you, right? Don't be conformed to this world, but... And then he says, be transformed. Now, it's the same word, just a different prefix. Form is the root. Trans means to change. Do you know what that implies? If, 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 if when you're but be transformed, that implies that you are already conformed. Do you understand what I'm saying? That you're already like that. Because in order to be different, you have to change from what you are today or what you are now. Because all you have is a fleshly nature. At the moment that you get saved, now you have the new man. And that's when... Not, it's not that the change is just going to happen, but that's when the change should start happening. You should start to change. Not everyone does, but you should attempt to not be like this world. That's why it's so embarrassing and pathetic when Christians are attempting to be like this world. And when churches are literally trying to advertise that, hey, you're welcome here because we're like the world. It should be the exact opposite. Right. A church should be the exact opposite. It should be a place like, hey, when, when, here's, I'm glad that when I went back to church that it was not like the world. 
Like, that's the reason why I wanted to go back to church, because I was sick and fed up with what the world is like. I was looking for something that I could change and better my life, and I could go to God, and hey, I want to do things that are better. You get sick and tired of the world, right? Churches today, when they stand up and they try to appeal you know, to, what, the, what they end up doing is when they appeal to the world, you know what they do? The, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. They bring in a couple of people that are like the world, and then before you know it, the whole church is like the world. They think that they can kind of just dabble in this. Like, hey, we're just going to just get a rock band. Just play, just, we're just going to play the music. The preaching's going to stay the same. All that's going to stay the same. It doesn't work like that. When you start just, just dabbling in it, over time, your church is going to evolve and change and where you're just going to be totally like the world. Turn to 1 John chapter number 2 while we're talking about this. 1 John chapter number 2. Christians should be different than the world. The Bible always and all the time from the Old Testament, New Testament, speaks of a division that is supposed to be between God's people and between the world. The, the God's people re should represent righteousness, holiness, all of these things, right? Sanctification, which the word means to be set apart, to be different. The world just represents, you know, the world, when you think of the world, I just think of heathenism, I think of paganism, I think of sinfulness. It's something that we should not try to be like. Look at 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2, I believe it's like verse, yeah, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And watch this. Look at this strong language. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If any man, it's either one or the other. If you have a love for the world, you don't love God. You don't love the Father. If you, if you look at the things of this world, if you love the things of this world, you don't love the things of God. It's one or the other because they're polar opposites. They're totally different. Look at the next verse, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. Notice how he's saying it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. He's saying it's different. They're not the same. They're totally different. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So think about that. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Christians should be different. You should listen to different types of music than, than the world does. You should dress differently than the world does. You know, when I go to work, the majority of guys, when they come to work, you know, they don't tuck their shirts in. They come in and they look sloppy. I'm not trying to, you know, just lift myself up. But I'm saying, you should try to, like, represent Christ. You should be different. There should be something about you when you go to work that people notice. Or when you go out in the world in any way. When ladies, you know, when, when ladies go where they go. Wherever, when people would see you, right? Food banks. No, I'm just kidding. When you go out, right? They should be able to identify. There's something different about that guy. He's not exactly like me. I can't quite figure it out. But there's something different about him. He dresses different, whatever it may be, right? You know, you know, think about if you were to give a guy a ride, right? You're going to say, hey, let's go grab some lunch. It's some guy you work with, right? Or, hey, I'm hungry. Do you mind if I ride with you? And he gets in, and he knows you're a Christian, and then music pops on. It's the same music he, he listens to. Think about that for a minute. It's like, you're just like me. There's no difference in you and me, right? If, you know, but if they would be, in some sense, it would depend upon what type of Christianity they're familiar with. They would be maybe surprised by that. They'd say, oh, you're just like me, I guess. No difference in you and me. That's, that's the exact opposite of what it should be. You should be. You should be different than the world. You should not be like the world. You know, the music that we listen to should be different than the world. God's music is not the same as the music of the world. CCM music is the same as the music of the world. It's, it's the same type. That's what they're trying to do. The, you know, even, even from just like... From a, a just an uneducated opinion from music, I can listen to it and tell that the rhythm is the same, that they're just trying to make it, they're trying to imitate, use the same types of instruments. On They just make it sound exactly like the music of the world. That's exactly what they're trying to do. They want it to appeal to people that are of this world. That's the purpose of the music. That's what they want to do. That's not what we'll, that's not what we'll ever do here. We will never have ever have any kind of CCM music here. Ever. Amen. I am super against that. It always have been. It always thought it was ridiculous. And you know there's a guy that I knew very, very well. I still love this guy. But he had a church. And we used to go to his revivals and stuff right around where I lived. He was an independent fundamental Baptist. I believe he graduated from Hiles Anderson. 
And we would go to his revivals, and over a course of about five years, he, his music just slowly started to change. Like first he just got, I don't remember exactly what he did, but he, you know, he would add just like certain instruments slowly, right? And yeah, he would add all these instruments until he was just like just playing full-blown CCM music. But it's like an independent Baptist church. We went, the last revival that I went to there before I moved to Arizona, there was a guy that was up preaching that was known for like being like a super hard preacher. And the guy stood up and he's like, he's like, I don't recommend to do this if you're a guest preacher, but he's like preaching against the church that he's at. And he's like asking them like, what's your soul winning times? And I don't remember this guy's name, but he's a pretty good preacher actually. He's like, what's your soul winning times? He asked the pastor. And they're like, oh, we have this soul winning time, we have this soul winning time, we have this soul winning time. He's like, how many people from your church showed up at the last soul winning time? And mind you, I don't keep in contact with this guy a lot, so I didn't know about this. I didn't know how his church was changing. And he holds up his hand. Goose egg. I don't think that that is a coincidence at all. Not even a tiny bit. You, and, and I guarantee that even less people are going soul winning. Let me tell you this, and I know for a fact that they used to go soul winning a lot before that. They used, to, they used to have actually a very strong soul, probably a stronger soul winning uh, uh, system at their church than we did at our church. And he holds up his hand. None. This is about five years after they just, and you can slowly see the change. You can even see the change in their church. You know what? When you walked in in the past, you could tell. It's not like, oh man, this place is crappy. But it's like, you, you, just looking back now, I can tell that they didn't have you know, a lot of, you know, they didn't pay a lot of attention or they just weren't consumed with how the building looked. But you know what else they started to do? They started to just pay a lot of attention of how their building looked. They started just to invest a lot of money in the things of this world, things that don't mean anything. At the exact same time, you need to, this is, what you, this is where it all starts, in your mind. You need to make sure that you, that you care about the things of God. That you care about the things of, you know, the Bible. That's where the, the source of all things are. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. If you want to walk in the spirit, then, you know, this, this needs to be in your heart. This needs to be in your mind. You need to be reading this all the time. And you'll never be, mis, you know, uh, misguided. Amen. So look again, verse number two. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by, and he says, the renewing of your mind. So how is there going to be a change in your mind? By reading the Bible. Amen. By the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself, excuse me, more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So there we see, you know, an admonishment or an exhortation. Not to carry yourself in a prideful manner. You shouldn't view yourself and just lift your, your, you know, your own self up on a pedestal in your own mind. And just think like, man, I am a great guy. I just, everything that I do is just like, when I'm done with it, it turns to gold. You know what I mean? You shouldn't just have like this attitude about yourself. Where you should try and attempt to think of yourself lower. You know, like Jesus, when he, when he tells the parable, and this is also repeated back in Proverbs the book of Proverbs. Now he talks about how, you know, when you go in and you're invited to, you know, uh, like a wedding, don't go up to the uppermost room, right? You go down to the low room. You go down and sit in the lower seats. That's what he's saying. You know, why would a person do that? Because it's the way that they view themselves, right? If, if, if you walk in and there's like, you know, there's like VIP or something and some guy's like, yeah, that's for me. And you just walk over there and sit down. It's like you're, you're showing the way that you view yourself, like what you think about yourself, like, that's why, I, you know, I actually, you know, I deserve that, right? You should attempt not to look at yourself highly. Right. You should attempt just to say, I'm just a, you know, a normal guy. There's nothing special about me. Because, you know, human nature is in every person to try to lift themselves up. And that's why he's saying this. And to try to make themselves, you know, in their own minds, like, I'm this great guy. I'm this great person, right? You shouldn't do that. You should think of yourself lowly. You should think of yourself like, because, I mean, because truly, what are we, Right? I mean, what do, you know, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? We're the creation. You know, what we do, the, the, the little things that we do on this earth amounts to nothing. You know, we should be humble in the sight of God. Amen. Keep reading there, it says at the end, but to think soberly, and notice how it says soberly. That's like, you need to think of yourself the way, like, how you really are. That's what he's saying, like, you need to be sober. Like, I speak forth the words of truth and soberness, is what Paul said, right? So soberness, soberness makes me think of, like, truth. 
Like you need to think of yourself the way that you really are lowly. You're not that great is basically what he's saying. <laughs> According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And what he goes into right now is actually setting this, this, what I just explained is what he's getting ready to go into right now. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So now he's saying we have many members in one body. Now, a lot of times, you know, I mean, some people would, I guess, but I would say by and large, the majority, when they would refer to the, to the, to the, you know, their arms, their legs, we wouldn't normally call that our members. That is still, of course, correct, but I'm saying that that's not the way that the majority, they would probably say body parts, right? That's what it's referring to, but members in this context is, is it, obviously the Bible is perfect, but it, that the reason why he uses members here is to say that, you know, uh, that it's, it's, it's something that works. Right? You understand what I'm saying? If we were to put parts, that wouldn't work. That's why the Bible uses the word members here, because that's what, you know, it's something that is doing something. It's a member, right? That's the reason why we refer to people as church members. It's because of this right here. He's using an analogy right now of a church. And of the, that when he says the body, he's referring to the church. And he's saying that all the people in the church are like the members of a body, right? And he says they all have not the same office, like... The job of my arm is not the same job of my leg, right? My legs are meant to walk around, to run, and my arms are meant to pick things up. My fingers are, have a different meaning, a different use in life, right? But all my faculties of my body all have different purposes in life, right? He's saying that's the same way in the church. All the, you know, the church, the body, right? There's all different members in the church, and they all have different, he says, offices. And what do you think of when you think of an office? Think of work, right? Or a job, right? Office oftentimes will, you know, in, in, the, in the Bible specifically, it's just referring to like a position when it says an office. It's like, you know, officers at the church, right? If someone actually is actually on the payroll, that's when we would call them like an officer at the church normally. And, and that's what people miss. Like the whole purpose of the church is to do work. Like, that's the reason for the church. That's why he likens it up to a body that has members. Because what, what is your body always doing constantly? You're always working, you're moving, you're doing things, right? He's saying, they all, and they all have different purposes. They all have different jobs. They're supposed to be doing things constantly. Now he's going to go into that verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, Right? So we being many, talking about all the people in the church, are one body in Christ. Talking about the local church, one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Because our whole body, all the members are ultimately attached, right, to the same body. Everyone members one of another. And then he goes into verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy... Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So don't miss the context right now. So we started off explaining to you that people should not think of themselves higher or more highly, right, than they ought to think. Now, right now, he's going into all the different people at the church. And he's saying that they all have different jobs. And he speaks of this elsewhere. I believe it's in the book of 1 Corinthians. And he, he, he talks about all the members, the same exact analogy, the church being like the different members in a body. He talks about how they all have different jobs. And he, what, he, what he strongly speaks against is, is the same exact subject of what he's speaking against now here. It's that one member should not look down upon another member. One member of the body shouldn't think, I'm greater than the other member of the body because they're all important. They're all useful. That's why he says here at the very end, let us prophesy as according to the proportion of faith. Saying that some people are going to have greater faith than others, right? And then he goes into like, for ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Now first, let me just say prophecy there. When he says prophecy, let us prophesy, that's talking about preaching. Just make sure we have all the right definitions. A lot of people have weird ideas about what different things in the Bible are. And they'll say, well, prophesy, they're just like speaking revelations. You know, things to come of the end times or just things that have never been revealed yet or something like that. The word prophesy just means to preach. That's all that it means. The word prophesy just means to preach. So it says there, verse 7, for ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Now, there obviously the word ministry is, is referring to being a servant, right? 
It's referring to like a, a minister. That's what that actually means, a person that's that. And notice what it used, let us wait on. What do you say? What does somebody say when they come to your table and they're getting ready to be your server? Hi, I'll be waiting on you. And what are they doing? They're serving you. They're a waiter, right? Let us wait on our ministry. Saying that this person is a person that would do more of like, I would refer this to that as like the labor, right? Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. So these are different people that have different jobs. And there may be one person that does a lot of these things. Or maybe one person only does one of them. Maybe another person that does half of them. These are all different, different jobs, different offices of the church. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Now to exhort someone is to basically try to compel them to do more. To ex I exhort you therefore, brethren, right? The Bible will talk about that oftentimes. Paul especially will say that. Speaking about exhorting people, saying I'm urging you strongly to do this. It's very similar to the word beseech, but the word beseech kind of carries more of like a beg, slant to it. And exhort is more of like... Kind of stronger, like I'm pushing you into doing this. You know what I mean? Now keep reading there. He says, Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. And then he says this, He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. I've heard different people interpret this differently, but I'll tell you what I believe about this. Giving, it's obviously talking about like giving to the church or something like that. He says, let him do it with simplicity. Let me give you, so this is the way you should do it, right? With simplicity, let me give you a bad example of the way that you should do it. How did the Pharisees do it? They would go out and they blow a trumpet. Is that, sim is that simplistic? No, he's saying just like, you know, don't let your right hand know what your left hand does, right? Just that's, that's what Jesus tells you to do. So he says, when, when you're giving, do it with simplicity. Just like, you know, put the money in the plate. Don't like stand up and look around. You know, and drop in the plate. Do it with simplicity, right? Keep reading there. With simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. Turn to Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 24. Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 24. We're going to show that this is an attribute of someone that is a ruler. Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 24. I want to point this out to you, to you again. In the book of Proverbs, the same exact attribute being applied unto a ruler. Proverbs 12, 24, the Bible says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. Watch, watch, what, watch what it's contrasted with, too. But the slothful shall be under tribute. So notice, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule. What is it saying? A person that is diligent will be the ruler. That's The reason why I wanted to show this to you again is this. Men in here, if you want to be a boss, you know one of the main. You know what the Bible says that a boss will be a diligent person. If you want to be, what does it mean to be diligent? It means to be thorough, right? It means you know if some, if, if you're assigned a job by someone, if if maybe your lead or something tells you, hey, make sure you do this. He gives you a task. If you work on the computer, whatever it may be, after you complete that task, go back over what you did again. Go walk back around and make sure that everything is complete again. If he maybe you know, uh, delegates to you a specific responsibility, when you're doing that job, be thorough. That's what diligent means. It, would, it means work hard and be thorough. It means that's what, that, that is the encompassing definition of being diligent. Someone that is diligent is someone that's paying close attention and they're trying hard. That's a diligent person. If you're given a task, do it with all your mind, number one, but then also review your work and make sure that everything is complete and everything is done right. That's a person that will be a boss. The diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. You know what the opposite of a diligent person is? A lazy person. A person that doesn't care that... A diligent person is someone that tries hard and they put a lot of effort into what they're doing and they want to make sure that it's good. The exact opposite is someone that's lazy. And the slothful person will not be the boss. The diligent person, if you are already the boss and you need to hire someone into another position, you're going to say, hey, that guy's going to make sure the job gets done right. Why? Because he's, he's diligent. What does that mean? He's thorough. I know he's going to double check his work. I know he's going to be careful while he's working. But not only that, he's going to work hard. He's going to try hard when doing it. So you see this over and over again, the two things associated with one another, right? The, the type of person that is a ruler is going to be a diligent person, right? Look there again in Romans chapter number 12. <clears throat> Where are we at? Verse 8. He that ruleth with diligence. And then he says this. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. I always, I always, you know, just as I did now, just kind of laugh when I read that. 
Because he's telling you when you do this, make sure you, you, do, you do it this way. Why? Because these are, these are things that are hard to do, right? Like, you know, or, or, they're, or they're, they're, he's being contrasted with, you know, it's, it's basically being taught this is the right way to do it. Now, when you think of someone showing mercy, why are they showing mercy? Oftentimes because they've been done wrong. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's because they've been done wrong, and now because you've done this to me, I'm going to show you mercy. And he's saying when you show that person mercy, do, do it with a cheerful heart. Be happy. Because you know what we oftentimes do when someone does us wrong? Yeah, I forgive you. Like in a drudging way. Drudgery. It's drudgery to us to, to forgive someone. But he's saying when you show mercy to someone, like be happy. Do it in a cheerful manner. And, and I always laugh because that can be hard. Yeah. Like if somebody like treats you crappy or does you wrong at work, you know what I mean? And they come to you or something and, and whatever, however the situation works out and it's time for you to show that person mercy, you know, it, it can be hard to be happy about it if you're mad. It can be hard if like they did something really bad to you because it doesn't matter. Like Peter asked how many times, you know, what type of situation, you always need to be able to give forgiveness to people, right? You always need to be able to show mercy to people. And when you do it, you need to do it cheerfully. You need to do it and be happy, right? Not just, you know, you need to do it from your heart. Look at verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Now, uh, when, it, when it says, and that's kind of exactly what he said before. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Like, you need to show mercy from your heart, right? And then he says right after that, he follows up that statement, let love be without dissimulation. Mercy is you showing love, right? He's saying, when you do it, do it cheerfully. He's saying, do it from the, from the heart. Like, he's speaking to the inner man. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, when you, because you can show mercy by doing an action, but does that mean that you're sincere? Because the exact, the exact, if I were to give you an antonym of, uh, or if I were to give you a, a synonym, actually, it would be a synonym of dissimulation. I would say it's a person or someone that is insincere. It would be if you're if you're dissimulating. Like here, I'll give you a perfect example. Like the other time this word is used in the Bible is in uh, Galatians uh, chapter number two, when it's talking about how James, when James came with the other brethren, does everybody know what I'm talking about? And the, and he came there with Peter, and uh, no, Paul speaking to Peter. When James came with the brethren, Peter stopped eating and sitting with the Gentiles. And it says that Bar even to the point where like Barnabas was carried about with his dissimulation. What's that saying? He, he, like he's not being sincere. He's being a hypocrite, right? A hypocrite is someone that's not sincere. When it's talking about let love be without dissimulation, it's saying let it be sincere, right? Make sure that it's sincere. Without, you know, another word would be like being disingenuous. Like genuine, disingenuous is, means the opposite there. Uh, keep reading, let love be without dissimulation. But watch this. This is interesting how he follows this up. Because he says, let love be without dissimulation. And people always want to focus on all the words, all the verses like love. God is love, right? And then, and then it's, it follows up with this. Abhor that which is evil. So you should just love only love. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil. The very next verse. And then notice, uh, when we look at this, it's two separate sentences, too. But it follows it up immediately right after. What does it mean to abhor something? Hate. 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 It's like strong. Right. Abhor means like hate. Like strongly. Abhor that which is evil. And then he says, cleave to that which is good. Turn to Amos chapter number 5. I believe I have this right. Amos chapter number 5. Amos chapter number 5, verse number 15. The Bible says this, Hate the evil and love the good. And then he says this, And establish judgment in the gate. That's what judgment is, right? It's, it's, it's hating evil, loving good. If you're going to be a judge, a, a good attribute of a judge, you know, a, really a prerequisite of a judge, would be that you hate evil and you love good. And when he says, abhor that which is evil, he's saying, hate the things that are evil. And then he says, cleave to that which is good. To cleave to something is like to grasp tightly, right? To hold on to and to not let go. He's saying, hate that which is evil, but embrace that which is good. Cleave to that which is good. Verse 10, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. 
And then he says, in honor, preferring one another. Verse 11, not slothful in business. Now keep in mind, what is the context right now? Who is he speaking to specifically and in what context? He's speaking to the body and to all the members, right? And what do the members have? They all have different offices. They all have different jobs. They all have different work that they should do, right? And then he says, not slothful in business. Why would he say that to the church? Because the church is a place to do business. It's a place to do work. That's the point of the church. It's not a social club. We're not here just to have fun and just to talk about things we're interested in. And, right. You know, that's not why. I love, you know, uh, you know, you know, studying the Bible, and I love, you know, coming here and even just sitting down and fellowshipping and bouncing ideas off of one another, talking about the Bible. But it's a place of business and it's a place of work. Amen. You know, we should view the church as something that where we come here, we know, like. We're going to get something done. You know what I mean? Like, we should we should have plans. When we come here, we should have goals. Right. And we shouldn't just, you know, let the newness of the church go away either. You know, if, if, that, if you start to get that way, you need to have a revival in yourself and know that we still have a plan to knock every door to Jacksonville. That's not going away. That's Amen. not going anywhere. That's still going to happen. Amen. And it's a place of business. Where, where we come here to work, and that's the purpose of this church, and we're going to get business done. Jesus said, you know, that he, he must be about his father's business. He had work for him to do, right? The church, not slothful in business. Watch what he says after that, too. Fervent in spirit. What does it mean to be fervent? It means to be passionate or, or you know, to have fire. He, you, know, you have to make sure that you're reading these like with one preceding the other, right? He keeps contrasting things. And for that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Not slothful in business. What's the opposite of a, of a, of a lazy person, right? It would be a person that's fervent, a person that works hard, a person that's... And, you know, I think of a person that's, like, excited about their work or excited about what they're doing. Don't be lazy. Amen. Don't be slothful. Don't be a sluggard. Be fervent. The exact opposite. You should be excited and passionate and working hard. You should be diligent. Amen. Right? And look what he says next. Serving the Lord. Notice, just working, serving the Lord. Why is he saying this in this context? Because we're all many members in one body. We all have different jobs. We all have different offices. Keep reading there. It says... Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now, what we see, uh, you know, the rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. I am going to go ahead and turn back. It makes me think of Romans chapter number 5. I'll just read it to you. You don't have to turn back there. But, you know, he says in verse number uh, 2, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And he says, And rejoice in hope. Of the glory of God. And then watch what he follows it up with. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. All speaking of uh, almost the exact same thing, right? He says rejoice in hope, right? You're happy and stuff when, you, when, you, when there's hope. When you have hope, hope in your soul. When you feel hopeful. And then he says, what's the next thing? Patient in tribulation. So when you're in tribulation, you should be patient. The word patient in the King James Bible carries a, you know, a connotation of, of enduring. It very much so of enduring. It talks about the patience of Job, right? And he endured through his trials. He endured through his tribulations. And then he says this, continuing instant in prayer. Verse 13, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. And that's really the definition of hospitality is to distribute to the necessity of saints, or it's just to distribute to someone's necessity. In this context, we're speaking specifically about giving thanks to the saints. But the definition of a person that is hospitable would be someone that distributes to that necessity, whatever the need is. In this case, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. What does it mean to be given to something? You know, it, it's, it's like, uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, you're consumed with it, right? You're given to that. Like, it's taking you over, right? That's what it's saying. You should be a person that's given to hospitality. You should be a person that's consumed with hospitality. Is that the way that you are? That can be difficult, right? We should look at these things and view these things like reality. We shouldn't look at this stuff and say, that's way up here. It's beyond my reach. That's not the right attitude. Like, like right there when it says, continuing instant in prayer in the verse before that. Like, how could I continue instant in prayer? How could I just, you know, obviously he's not saying like pray, you know, uh, just constantly all day long. And just never stop praying. Obviously we know Paul was a tent maker. He had a job. 
obviously, right? But there should be this continuation of, of prayer. We should be praying multiple times a day. Paul, when you look at his letters, you know, he says in, in, uh, in, in you know, that one little section of verses where it's like, you know, uh, uh, what, are, what are one of those? I can't remember what they are. Quench not the spirit, right? He goes on a list, and one of those in there says this, uh, pray, pray without ceasing. He says to all the churches almost every time when he opens up, you know, uh, I, cease, I cease not to make mention of you in my prayers. He says it constantly. So it's like, well, this is way out of my reach. Paul did it. He talks about constantly that I'm just I'm continually praying for you. And he's writing the church of Colossae. He's writing the Corinthians. He's writing the Galatians. He's writing the Ephesians. You say, I can't do this. Paul did it. It's humanly possible. Paul did it. You should be continuing, continually, continuing instant in prayer all the time. Every time you get an opportunity, you know, you have just a few minutes. Maybe you can't read your Bible. You don't really have anything to do. Why not pray? You should try to, to, to obtain under these things, to attain under these things. You should try to be given to hospitality. Look for the opportunity to invite people at the church over to your house. Look, or, look for an opportunity. That's a qualification of being a pastor, too. You need to make sure that if you want to be a pastor, you meet these qualifications. You need to be a person that is given to hospitality. You need to be consumed with hospitality, given to hospitality. You know, like when it talks about, uh, you know, in, in the late, when it's talking about not giving to wine. What's it saying? Like this person's like probably an alcoholic, right? Right? Yeah. So what does it mean to be given that to hospitality? In the same way that a drunkard is given to, to alcohol, you should be given to hospitality. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that kind of put it in perspective yeah. to you? I saw a couple of people kind of like, kind of clicked in their mind, I can tell. You know, given to hospitality. You should be consumed with that. Keep looking there. It's uh, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Turn to Luke chapter number 23, verse number 34. Luke chapter number 23, verse number 34. Notice what it said there. Bless them which persecute you. So those that are doing you harm, you should bless them. You should wish for good things to happen to them. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Luke number, what did I say, 23, 34. Luke number 23, 34. Twenty-three, thirty-four. Jesus, when he's on the cross, the Bible says this. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. And then he says this, for they know not what they do. And then it goes on, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. That's powerful. You can read over that and stuff. There's so much in the Bible that, you know, it's just, uh, when we read it, sometimes we just allow it to slip. The, the, the extremity of it, you know, the importance of it. But while Jesus was hanging on the cross, literally the person that was doing him harm, the, per the people that were killing him, he's like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So these people were doing this in ignorance. Obviously, the Roman soldiers had no clue what was going on, right? And the people, and think about this. This is why it matters, because the person that's doing it like in this case, could be ignorant of, of, per, of, of the person they're persecuting, of, of what they're doing wrong. An example being Paul. He was just wrong, right? He just didn't know what he was doing. Another example. The same, the same group of people, he said, Father, forgive them. They know that, not what they do. What did the Roman soldier, what happened to him a few minutes later, an hour later? What happened? He got saved. He realized, you know, this is the Son of God, right? So the people, it's not just speaking of like, because the Bible's clear there's a dividing line into this other group of just like horribly reprobate, weak, wicked, evil people. Right? But there's obviously a time, you know, when people are persecuting you, you should just by nature, you should bless them. You should. When people are doing bad to you, doing harm to you, unless it's obvious that this person is an enemy of God. Which falls in, and it's a super big rarity. Everybody, you know, a lot of people, especially in that movement, everybody knows what movement I'm talking about, they, they, everybody's a reprobate. It's like, it's like, you know, 50% of the population is, is cursed to hell already. Literally. It's crazy. It's such a small percentage of reprobates. Like, super small percentage of reprobates. I mean, let's just do the, the math on, if we were to pull up the statistics of sodomites, because I, you know, people are like, oh, he left off Romans 1, partial, because, you know, he's, he's going to want soft on the homos. Homosexuals, sodomites that are living in that lifestyle, a person that is a sodomite, 
is a reprobate. That's right. That right. person's not going to heaven. They have no hope. Amen. Their fate is sealed just as much as they were already in hell burning now. Right. They're not going to heaven. Right. But what's this what's the percentage of that amount of people? Super low, right? Right. Let's tack on another two percent. You know what is that? Like five percent population of the world? That means 95% of people, if they were to persecute you, you should bless them. Right. Can you grasp that number? That means if 10 people, if 10 people persecuted you, you know, like nine and a half times, you know, to, to, just, just to make it accurate with, with you know, the statistic that I just gave, you should be blessing them. I mean, does that kind of give you an idea? If 100 times you're persecuted, 95 times you should be blessing that person. Think about that. 95 times out of 100. I mean, so how often in your life when you're persecuted is it going to be like, damn you to hell? Not very often. Right. Not very often at all. Seriously. Very rare. I mean, if you, I've, I've been persecuted five times in my life, and I damned all five of them to hell. It's like, that doesn't make sense. When you have a clear statement right here, and you see Jesus, when, when he's dying on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, go back to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. Keep your hand here and then go over to Acts. I think it's 7. Acts chapter number 7. Acts chapter number 7, verse number 60. There at the end. This is the last verse of the chapter. Stephen, look at verse 59 so we get the whole context of it. Now, I want to do 58. I want to watch this consistency here. Verse 58. So I want to show you something. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Look at that. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now watch verse 60. And he kneeled down. This is while Stephen is being stoned to death. Literally the people that are killing him just like they killed Jesus. And cried with a loud voice, Lord. Lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What did he do? They were persecuting him, and he blessed them. Same situation, look at uh, chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Two perfect examples of when you see someone being persecuted and they bless, there's someone amongst that group that they're blessing that's ignorant that ends up getting saved. Two times. Two times. And then people just go around. You're wicked as hell. You're a devil. You're an idiot is what you are. You just right. have, you know, you're just consumed with hate right. is what's going on. But at the end of Romans chapter number 12, verse 21, yeah, I'm going to you know, skip ahead and ruin the story here, but it says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what happens when you fall into that category. You just don't, and you don't at least attempt to try to bless those that persecute you. You're overcome with evil is what happens. And you just, your whole life and your heart and everything is just like wickedness. Then you just walk around and you're looking for someone to damn. You're looking, you're like that person, you know, when you're driving on the highway that's just waiting for somebody to cut you off so you can cuss them out. You know what I'm talking about? People are like that all the time. There's just people that look for an opportunity. They're just bitter in their heart and they walk around looking for an opportunity to just say something bad about someone. Your default should be when someone does you wrong, you do right into them. Amen. That you should. When someone does, I mean, the statistical chance of a reprobate persecuting you is super slim. Very, very slim. I'm sure there were reprobates amongst those that were stoning Stephen. I'm sure there was. But he blessed, he blessed all of them. He wasn't sure who they were. It wasn't exactly you know, obvious of who they were. It's not like... You know, you know, they were all just like these flaming queers that are out there stoning him. You know what I mean? Just throwing rocks. They wouldn't even throw them hard enough to, to stone him down. But they're out there just, you know, stoning him. He doesn't know. He doesn't, he doesn't have any idea. And you know what? There was a guy among them that ended up doing way greater works than Stephen ever could have imagined. And he blessed, and he blessed those that persecuted him. Father, forgive them, that for they know not what they do. And then there's a guy standing there that has no clue that he's killing God. Has no idea that he's... And then what does he say? He proves that he's just totally clueless. He's like, this is the Son of God. Yeah. He had no idea. That's why you don't just go around and just flippantly just damn people to hell. You're a reprobate. Even people that aren't saved. Amen. 
I mean, if, if, if there's a situation where some guy, it's like obvious that this guy is evil, there's nothing wrong with rebuking someone. But you, 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 you know, your default shouldn't be when you're out soul winning just to be a jerk to everybody. Right. You should be, you're, you're there to get people saved, not right. to damn people. Right. If you're going around, if you're, it's like 50-50, like I knock on 10 doors and five of them I rebuke people and five of them I, you know, I, I, I was lovingly, I, was, I, I treated them in a loving manner and gave them the gospel. That's not right. You're out there to give good news. Right. It should be like the majority of what you do should be giving good news. Amen. If you knock 100 doors... 95 of them, I mean, a high, high percentage, the vast majority should be, hey, let me tell you what God did for you. Let me tell you what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. That's what you should be talking about. It shouldn't be just, a lot of people just go out just looking for an opportunity just to get into an argument. Soul warning people will say, not soul winning. That, you know, there's a time to warn people, but that's slim. There are reprobates, but they're hardly any. You know, I'm not going to stand up here and preach, you know, three, five, six, seven sermons a year on how much I hate sodomites. Although I do, Amen. because it's a waste of time. Right. When you're just consumed with stuff like that, you become overcome with evil. Right. That's what happens. You just become like this monster on the inside, just waiting. You know what you do? You start attacking people that are good, too. Because you're just like filled. You're just like, you know, just like gushing out and just pouring. You're oozing evil from your heart. That's what's happening. So you need to like have a default that I'm going to do that which is right. When someone persecutes me, I'm going to bless that person. When someone does me wrong, I'm going to bless. Like I said, there was probably reprobates there. He just blessed all those people. He doesn't know. He's not positive. But you know, there was a person there that ended up getting saved. Because he, he didn't know. You give people the benefit of the doubt. Right? Unless you know for sure. You know what I mean? Like if I knock on a door... And two dykes, and it's, it's obvious, I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine. Right. I know what the Bible teaches about the reprobate doctrine. I start talking to these people, and they're like, yeah, we're, you know, we're partners. We've been together for 15 years. We adopted this child. I'm out of there. You know what I mean? But that's not common. I mean, how often do you knock on a homo's door? Yeah. <laughs> super rare. Right. It's super rare. How often do you think you knock on a reprobate's door when you're out knocking? Super rare. You know, when you're persecuted 90% of the time, it, it's going to be the, the type of situation to bless them. Think about that. Most of the time, I'm just giving you statistics that are just, they're Tyler Baker Gallup polls here. I don't know exactly a number, but I'm just saying, the, my point is this, a vast majority of the time when you're persecuted, you, I mean, some of these people that just go around cursing everybody, I'd like to ask them, the last time you were persecuted and you blessed somebody, tell me about that. What was their name? Think about that. Never. That's why, because they, because they just, they, they, they become overcome with evil and then they enjoy that. Yep. They do. They love, they love it. It's wicked. That's super wicked. It is. Evil heart is what they have. Look there at verse number 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So no, it's, you know, uh, this should be referred to as like empathy. A lot, when you go to a funeral, it's not a time to laugh, right? You know, when you go to a funeral and you know that there's a family member that has passed away and, you know, it's, let's say it's a distant family member and the brother of that person, you know, of that person that, that, that is deceased is there, you should go to that person and try to comfort them. You're not going to go to them and laugh. You know why? Because you're not going to make them feel better. You're going to make them feel worse. It's not a time to laugh, right? There's time, there's, there's a time to laugh. There's time to have fun. Like Ecclesiastes, you know, three, I believe it is, speaks about that. It's time to weep, right? There's time to mourn. You know, there's a time when people are rejoicing. Rejoice with them. They'll make you'll make them feel better if you do that, right? When someone's weeping, you know, you should show empathy. You should try to sit. You know, you tell me just to cry and not, you know, be sincere. Just start crying. I'm, no, you, you need to at least you need to try to be sincere. Right? You need to try to, from the heart, you should try to put yourself in that person's shoes, whatever the situation is. But, you know, some, you know, horrible thing that happens in their family, some sort of tragedy, you should mentally try to put yourself in that person's shoes. And when, when they weep, you should try to weep with them. I mean, let's take the Bible for what it says. When a person is weeping and they're sad and they're sorrowful, weep. Look at look what it says. Weep with them that weep. I, I, I believe the Bible literally, unless... I can't take it literal. That's the only time, right? When, the, when it's clearly not literal. 
If a person is weeping, it's a, it's a brother. We're speaking of the members of church, right? They're sad. It's something, you know, if they're crying for some reason that they shouldn't be crying, it's a man, you need to tell them, be a man, right? But if there's someone that something bad has happened, weep with them. You'll make them feel better, right? You know, uh, misery loves company, right? When someone is upset and someone is, 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 you know, in a situation that is a miserable situation, when they see somebody else is miserable with them, I don't know why, but it makes them feel better. <laughs> Seriously, you know what I'm saying? Then they all of a sudden don't feel as alone. That's called empathy when you try to mirror or reflect another person's emotions or what state that they're in in their life. You need to try to be empathetic is what that is. With a person, you'll make them feel better, right? <clears throat> Keep reading there. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind. So right after he says, rejoice with them that rejoice, telling them, be of the same mind. Weep with them that weep. Then he just says it plainly. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. So notice again the, 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 the admonishment not to be prideful, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. He says, mind not high things, right? You shouldn't just go around life and living your life, you know, just minding high things. Things that would make put you into another category. Things that would make you look like you're a big shot or something like that. Don't mind high things. And he says this, condescends. What does it mean to condescend? Descend means to go lower, right? Con means with. Because he's talking about you doing this with someone else or to someone else. So it says condescend to men of low estate. You need to be humble and humble with other people, right? What were we, what were we just looking at? Weep with them that weep. That would be a perfect example. Like condescend men to uh, condescend to men of low estate. And then he says, be not wise in your own conceits. So you shouldn't be wise in your own conceits, prideful in your own mind. Conceits are like your own thoughts. Again, like I was talking about at the very beginning, we're still on the same subject. He wanted to warn all the members of the church, you're not any greater than anybody else, because all none of the members can survive about the other members. Remember, in, I think I should have looked it up, but it's in like 1 Corinthians, I believe, where he's talking about, you know, can the foot say to the nose, I have no need of thee? Right? Talking about the same exact subject. He's, he's making the same point here. That's why he started with, don't you know, mind high things. You need to think of yourself soberly, right? You know, uh, you know, think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And then right now he concludes with it again. But what was the whole subject in that context? He's speaking about the church, how they all have many different members. And some people are having a different proportion of faith. What's a proportion? It's a measurement. There's people that are going to be greater at different things at the church, but us, certain people shouldn't look down on other people. That's his whole point. And then he follows up with common sin to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits, in your own mind. You start to know the Bible better. You start to memorize a lot of the Bible. You start to do all these different things. You're a great soul winner. That doesn't make you just better than all these people. Some person comes in off the street and they're a brand new Christian. You shouldn't look down upon that person. You should condescend. That's a perfect example. Condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Because notice, it's in your own conceits. It's in your own mind. Now, you're the one thinking so great, greatly of yourself. That doesn't mean that it's actually that way. You know, even a person from our perspective that in his own mind thinks he's great, we, he in reality may not even be that great. Because it's in his own conceits. Be not wise in your own conceits. <clears throat> And then he says, this is also on the subject of being persecuted and blessing those that persecute you. It says this, recompense. Recompense means to pay. Like compensation means to pay. It, you know, to re, it's basically saying repay. Recompense or repay. Recompense to no man evil for evil. He's saying so. When a person does evil to you, and he, notice he says no man. Now, there is, you know, there can be in certain situations an exception, but the default, and I'm going to show you that this passage teaches that. The default should be recompense to no man evil for evil. No man. It should just be like no man. When someone does you evil, don't do evil back, right? Recompense to no man evil for evil. When you're persecuted, someone's doing evil most of the time in the Bible means harm. When someone does you harm, you shouldn't just like... You punch me, I'm punching you back. That could be real super hard. I'm not going to lie. If somebody hit me, that would be real hard not to recompense them evil. But you know what? You shouldn't. 
it, it'd be real hard. You shouldn't. Now I'm like picturing in my mind, like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Recompense to no man evil for evil. And then he said, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Notice how he's stressing all men, isn't he? All men. No word in the Bible is, 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 you know, when he says all, he really means all. Every person. All men, right? But then you have a caveat here. It's not meant to be a caveat. He's just saying God knows that there are situations where things are different. If somebody attacks your family, you know, you should men should defend their family. He's saying, you know, he doesn't want to just, he wants to explain to you there's reason, right? There are times, but he wants you also to understand that no man, like, like I said, 99.99% of the time, no man. But if someone attacks your family, obviously God wants you to protect your family. In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about if somebody breaks into your house and it's still dark, whether they're there to steal whatever they do, you know, if you kill that person and it's dark, you're protecting your home. You're protecting your family. You have no, re you have no idea why they're there. God instituted that law. Why? So that the man could protect the home. He knew that there are situations, right? But by and large, a Christian should not be just returning evil for evil when someone does them wrong. Right. You know, I would say most Christians... The majority, almost every Christian, should go from the beginning of their life to the end of their life. It would be wrong for them to recompense evil. That's how rare it is. I'm just telling you just my thoughts, just my reason, right? Just from reading the Bible, there are, of course, situations, but it's very rare. Look what it says in verse 18. Here is the, the situation that would be the super rare exception. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, why does he say, if it be possible? Is he saying, you know, only if it's possible for you? That's not what he's saying. That would make no sense. If he's saying, if it be possible, no, he's saying, sometimes it's not possible. He wouldn't say, if it be possible, like, well, like, well I'm just a person that gets real mad. If, if it's not possible for you, I understand, because you just, you're just a really angry person. No, he's saying, if it be possible, like, if the situation, if it's possible in the situation, don't return evil for evil. Don't return harm for harm, right? You understand what I'm saying? That's the only way in which this, this could apply. Why would he say, if it be possible? Because there is a rare situation where it's not possible. Where someone is harming your daughter or harming your children, do you think God's just like, nope, recompense, no man evil? Of course you need to protect your daughter. You need to protect your family. But it's the point is this. It's super rare. If it be possible... As much as lie within you, he says, live peaceably with all men. You should attempt and try to live peaceably with all men. Amen. When I say all men, I mean all men. If I like, to use the example before, I knock on the door, and there's the two dykes that are there, right? I'm not going to just, like, blow up on these people. Right. You know, if they want to, you know, if they say something disgusting to me, I'll let them have it. But, you know, what I'll do is, hey, I find out they're dykes, I just say, hey, you're not welcome at our church. And I would just leave. What am I doing? I'm trying to live peaceably. If it be possible, live peaceably with all men. Yeah. There's no reason. Tell me, you know, these people go around and they want to just like every sodomite, they knock on their door. They want to make sure that they know that they're burning in hell. I don't care. It's not like I wouldn't tell that person because I care about their feelings. I can give a rip whether or not what they think, you know, if I say, hey, you're going to go burn in hell. Or if somebody says that to that person, like it's a sodomite or something. It's not like, oh, don't say that to them because I care about the feelings. No, it's a waste of time. You're right. doing that for you, retard. Exactly. You just want to go knock on the door and say, and just act like you're this tough guy. No, you're a child and you're immature. Right. And you just want to go right, you're obviously, you know, you obviously have, uh, you know, uh, I can't think of what the word is. But these people are obviously trying to compensate for something. You know, you're not a tough guy and you're doing this to try to prove to yourself that you're a tough guy. It's like it's a waste of time. What are you gaining from just telling a sodomite they're burning in hell? Right. They probably already know that. Seriously. I'll tell you why. I had, there was a, a I'm, we're about done here. I'm going to tell you a story real quick. I, so this is a real interesting story, though. I should have told this in Romans chapter 1. It's about a reprobate. So one time I was off soul money with my dad. Probably before I ever even, you know, even knew of the church in Arizona. I'm going to try to get them out of my vocabulary. Or people listen to this. I don't want them to like associate me. Right. Stay as far away as I can. So I was probably like, it, it was before I ever even knew of them. I was out soul winning one time with my dad. We were walking around. We were done soul winning. We were getting in our car. And there's this, this lady that comes up and she's a bum. 
And what she, she, you know, I couldn't really identify that she was a dyke right away because she was homeless. And normally that's how you can tell the way they dress, the way you know they do their hair and stuff like that. But I couldn't really tell that she was a dyke because she's just like wearing, you know, just like rags. You know what I mean? And she's just a scrubby person in Newport, just kind of a rough area. She comes over to the door and she's like, "Hey, can you do this, this, and this?" Or something. She asks us for something. And my dad's in the car already. I was about to shut the door. And I was like, "You know, no, but but hey, uh, you know, we're going out and invite people to church. I gave her an invitation. Like I said, I had no clue it was a dyke already. And she's like, at this point, and she's like." Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. She's like, well, I'm not interested. And I said, okay, more important than that, if you were to die today, you know for sure you go to heaven. She's like, no, I know for a fact I'm not going to heaven. And I was like, why? And she's like, I just know there's no chance I can go to heaven. And I was like, why? And why would you know that? I mean, I, you know, I think I said something too, like, which was totally incorrect. Like, everybody can go to heaven. Not that I, I, I it was just, it's just the default. I even knew the reprobate doctrine at that time, but it's like, I, you know what I mean? You're just like, everybody can go to heaven. I've said it to other people too. It's just like, it's the, that's such a rare exception is my point. Everybody can go to heaven. Why? I mean, she was, it was not detectable that she was queer at all. And then she said, uh, because, you know, uh, because I, I, uh, I'm a, I think she said, she didn't say sodomite. I keep wanting to say sodomite. She said, I'm a, I'm a homosexual or something like that. And then she just turned around Turn, turned around and walked away. I thought about that for a while. And I thought about how that person knew. Like, I can't go. She was super adamant. Like, I can't go to heaven. Like, I know I can't go to heaven. I think she even said, like, she said, like, five times, like, God wouldn't, would, I, I'm positive God wouldn't let me to heaven. Like, she was super adamant about it. And I'll tell you why I think sodomites know that. Because I've heard other people say that they've had sodomites say that to them. It's because, why do you get rejected? Right. So do you know what you know in your mind? I've rejected God. So you know in your heart, like, I've already rejected him. There's no way he's going to... You know what I'm saying? You know in your mind, like, I've already rejected God. Like, it's done and over. That's what you know for sure that you've done. That's why these people would know. I have no idea what that had to do with what we were talking about. But if it be possible, <laughs> as much as why I think you live peaceably with all men. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Look at verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now, I've always heard this verse isolated and taught not what it's saying at all. I've heard verse 20 taught, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Right? If he thirst, give him drink. And then it says, for, because in so doing, in doing that, thou shalt, or you will, heap coals of fire on his head. I've always heard that taught, that you're heaping coals of fire on his head, because like when you give him a drink, and he's your enemy, and he's done you bad, you're making him feel bad. Has anybody else ever heard that before? I've heard that before. You've heard that before? That's not what this is saying at all. Look at the verse right before it. Actually, let's start with verse 17. What did I say recompense means? To repay, right? Pay back. Same exact thing. Repay, it's saying. A recompense. No man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. All men. Skip to verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. What did he just tell you not to do? Not to pay back when someone does you evil, right? Keep reading. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Now let's see whose wrath this is going to be. For it is written, vengeance is mine. Look at this. I will repay so when someone does you wrong, you shouldn't pay them back. Why? Because God's going to pay them back. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, so because of that, therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, for, meaning because in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. You are not the one that should be paying your enemies back. What you need to worry about doing is just do good to all men if be possible. You know, repay. If someone does you evil, pay them back with good. Because it's not your job to do that. Let God pay them back Amen. when the time comes. People are like, yeah, what it's teaching here is in this, in this type of situation, you're going to heap coals of fire on that because they're going to feel real bad. You know, that, that they've done you wrong when you do them good. That's not what it's teaching at all. It's saying when you do them good, God, here's the thing. When you look this up in the Old Testament, I can't remember the exact... Uh, it's in Proverbs, but I can't remember how it's worded. It's quoted, and it says, it says after that that God will give you a reward. 
right? Look at the very next verse and keep in mind everything that we've been talking about. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So you should be overcoming evil. With, when someone does you wrong, you should overcome that evil with good. And then God will give you a reward, right? And then God will punish them because it's not your job. If you become overcome with evil, are you going to receive a reward? Which if, 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 if someone does you evil... And then you just do evil back when God says do not. Do you think you're going to receive a reward? You're not, right? Of course not. So he's saying don't fall down to their level. When someone does something, you shouldn't lose out on a reward because some idiot does something bad to you. You understand what I'm saying? It's in Proverbs 25. I have it written down here. Go back to Proverbs 25 and I'll show you where it actually says that. And we'll, and we'll end in, in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 25. You always learn something. When you look up the verses, I know I said that many times, but that's super important. It's super important. Anytime there's something quoted from the Old Testament in the New Testament, always look that up. Proverbs 25, verse 21. It says, If thine enemy be, be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. And then he says, And the Lord shall reward thee. So when he does you, when he does something bad to you, you should do something good back to him. And then you'll receive a reward. But if he does something bad to you and you do something bad back to him, you're not going to receive a reward. And by the context, I can't prove this, but it would make a lot of sense that the reward would be God paying them back. Because why would he quote that right there afterwards? Be, and then either way, it says, it, this is a major reason not to. This is the main reason. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. When someone, You know what that means? That the, the immediate reaction, the knee-jerk reaction when someone does something wrong to you is to do what? To do something wrong back. And when you overcome evil with good, it's hard to do that, but that's a victory. You've won. That's something good. Because why? Because it's difficult. You know, it's, it's hard. It's easy when somebody does something bad to you to do something bad back. You know, that doesn't make you tough. That doesn't make you a man. You understand what I'm saying? Like, the way that Jesus lived his life, the, the things that he did, he was a man. He was like the ultimate example of a manly, masculine man. Amen. He did all the things that no one wanted to do. And you know what? A lot of what he did was serving. And when people persecuted him, you know, you always think of like the big, tough, you know, guy that's just like this, this pagan, uh, you know, foul mouth guy. He, what is he? He's totally out of control. You know why? The guy like that goes to the bars and he's just like this big muscular guy who's getting in fights all the time. He's not a tough guy. He has no discipline. Right. You're just a loud mouth. You can't control your mouth. You can't control your spirit. You're just out there making a fool and, a, and just a, an idiot of yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, getting in a, in a physical fight and beating some guy up, that doesn't make you a tough guy. That doesn't make you tough because you can't rule your own spirit. You're obvious like a child. You just can't control the things that come out of your mouth. You can't control the things that you do. You have no discipline of your own self and no discipline of your own spirit. You know what's hard? When someone does you wrong to do good back to them. The things that Jesus did in his life, he proved to be a real man. When they persecuted him, he blessed them. You know how hard that would be, the people that are literally stabbing a spear into your side to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I mean, think about that. Obviously, they did that later, but it's, I mean, it's in the process. He's dying on a cross right now, and the guy's standing there with a spear, right? And, and being God, he probably knew, or I'm sure he knew. I know there's things hidden from him as, you know, being failed in the flesh. There's a good chance he knew that was going to happen afterwards. And he's just sitting there knowing that this guy is going to do that. God, Father, forgive him for, for they know not what they do. Amen. I mean, think about that. That is much harder than just like, curse that guy to hell, Lord. You know what I'm saying? That's like, now you, now, that's, you know, being a tough guy. Amen. That's being, you're actually showing that I have some discipline. You understand what I mean? You're actually showing I have some inner strength. This person that's just like, when they get persecuted, they're just like, you know, just, they want to just say, all, they want to like pour out all the, you know, the, the history, the bad history of a person, take out their dirty laundry. 
You're just showing me right now that you're a weak person and you can't control yourself. You, that's been like, you're mad at this person and that's been just like, you know, you know, setting you on fire on the inside and you weren't able to keep it in because you're weak. You understand what I'm saying? When someone does you wrong, you don't do wrong back to them. You should do good to them. When someone persecutes you, you shouldn't just look for an opportunity to get that person back. You should bless them. Uh, even, even more so if it's like a, a brother in Christ. If a brother in Christ does you wrong, obviously there are things, you should, if it's serious, you should take it to him. If they don't hear you, you go to the church. I'm talking petty matters. If something happens, you forgive them. If, it, if, if this is in the context, the two perfect examples that are always brought up, the two most obvious examples that are, that are brought up, are people that aren't saved? I mean, how much more a Christian when they do you wrong? Someone in the church. That is a major teaching of like those last like seven verses. Somebody does you wrong. Why would you spend so much time in that chapter? Somebody does you wrong because it's hard and it's important. It's important. It's something important in the Christian life. But it's real hard. It needs to be hammered. You need to start putting these things into practice. Don't just read the Bible like it doesn't matter. When the Bible says that when someone persecutes you, you should bless them. You should do that. You should really look for an opportunity. Hey, the next time somebody calls me a reprobate on Facebook, or I don't even have a Facebook, on YouTube... You know, as long as I know that that person's, you know, not a reprobate themselves, I'll say, God bless you, brother. You should look for opportunities. If they're saved, I'd say, brother. Bless is my little brother. He better not be saying, you know, calling me names. Right? You should look for opportunities. Next time somebody says something bad to you, somebody does something bad to you at work, look for an opportunity. Put this stuff into practice. You know, we're not here just, you know, to hear entertaining preaching or to just have fun during the preaching or to talk afterwards. You know, what I preach shouldn't just go over your head in one ear, out the other. You just forget about it and go home. You should, every message, you should be trying to retain it, go home, and look for an opportunity to put it into practice. The Bible is not meant just to, just to you know, be like an education book that you can walk around. It's just like, just, just like blowing your brain up so you can just show off and be like some theologian. You understand what I mean? It's meant to change your life, right? Try to change your life with the teachings of the Bible. And that's a strong thing. When somebody persecutes you, bless them. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for the great example you set, dear Lord. You're always the greatest example of all things. We're so thankful that you came down and you, you loved us so much. You died on the cross, dear Lord. But we're so thankful for all the things that you did. You showed us how to be a real man. You uh, Thank you so much for just giving us the Bible, dear Lord God. And, and, uh, and how much that there is of it. How many that you, that you didn't you know, hide things from us, but that you gave us you know, uh, what we need to live a, a fulfilled Christian life to, to, uh, under the, the perfect man so we can come under the perfect man someday. Uh, we love you, Lord. Just be with us. We thank you for the examples of, of Stephen and all those in the Bible as well. Help us to put it into practice. Help us to use the Bible, not just to store it in the back of our brains, but to actually use it weekly, daily, and uh, help us to pray without ceasing and, and try to remember all the things we learned tonight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.